We live in a remarkable time. At the time that I'm recording this episode, astronomers know of more than 5,000 confirmed exoplanets, as well as thousands of unconfirmed exoplanets. Just nobody has had the telescope time to confirm all of the characteristics of these other worlds. And yet many of them are going to be really fascinating topics, things that can help us understand the formation of hot Jupiter's migration of planets. Do any of them have atmospheres? Uh, are there other Earths in there? And so really, it's just a matter of figuring out the best way to organize all of this outstanding data to work with all the tools that astronomers have today to be able to study them. And a good example of that, of course, is JWST that has limited time and people want to use it for all kinds of things. And so what is the best way to organize the time on JWST to look through all of the exoplanets that has the potential like you've got to make some choices. So my guest today is Ben Horde. He is a researcher with NASA Goddard, and he just published a paper with like 150 of his colleagues, where they built a large criteria to look through all of the potential exoplanets and figure out what are the best criteria for doing follow on observations with JWST. So we talk about his paper, uh, what kinds of planets are probably the most exciting ones to look at, what big outstanding questions we might have, what techniques are going to be able to take this further, as well as sort of his specific research focus, which is the formation of hot Jupiters. Did they form in place? Did they migrate inward? What happens to the other planets? It's still a real open question in exoplanets. So enjoy this conversation with Ben Hort. Hi, Ben. I reach out to you because this the paper that you are the the first author on um, has a lot of the buzzwords and keywords that I'm really interested in. But also, anytime I see a lot of authors on a paper, it piques my interest. And I don't think I've seen a paper with this many authors since the Kilanova discovery in 2017. How many people worked with you on this paper? So believe it or not, the count is actually growing every day as more people surface saying, oh, I have some data that you could use. Oh, is it too late for me to, to pitch in and send you what I have? Um, the count currently, I think, is somewhere between 145 and 150 authors on this paper. So uh, when I say that it was a group effort, it really was a group effort. It seems like yeah. we kind of got the whole community involved in this one. Right, right. And the work is important. I mean, you know, how would you describe what you're trying to do. Sure. So I think just maybe as the backdrop here, we have this fabulous new telescope, JWST, which I think many people have heard of either in the news or because they're really interested in astronomy. And um, it is absolutely fantastic at looking at exoplanetary atmospheres to determine what chemistry is going on there, um, what kind of dynamics are going on. It can answer questions about formation. And so we have this resource, but it's not an infinite resource. J JWST won't be flying forever, and it's everyone wants to use it because it's not just for exoplanets. It's for galaxies and dust and everything in between. And so the challenge is we also have so many exoplanets that we want to observe, um, but which ones should we observe and which ones are easiest to observe? And so what we decided to do is uh, calculate a bunch of different metrics for each individual exoplanet and say, OK, in this part of parameter space for planets of this size and this temperature, these are the ones that you're probably going to get the easiest uh, signal to detect. So it might not be the most scientifically interesting. I, I think most of them are very scientifically interesting, but um, we classified which ones would be the best to observe that we're almost certain we're going to get something out of. And so it was kind of a, a prioritization uh, tool for the community in order to determine which planets sh could be observed the best and how, how to best use this great resource that we now have. And so when you're looking at the tests objects of interest, what characteristics are you pulling out as a way to sort and search this gigantic list and then to pick the low hanging fruit off of it? That's a great question. So we calculate an, a number of different metrics. So um, there's actually two ways that you can observe an exoplanet's atmosphere. The first is called transmission spectroscopy, and that's where as the planet passes in front of the host star, 
some of the light from the star actually passes through the atmosphere of the planet. And we can see that with our telescopes, in this case with JWST, and all the light that passed through leaves its own individual fingerprints on uh, what chemical species were there, and some is absorbed and some is remitted. And so um, that's one way. The other way is emission spectroscopy, where instead of the planet going in front of the star, the planet is now going behind the star. And so we're trying to see, okay, well, how much of the total light that we're looking at the combined star and planet system is from the planet, because once it goes behind the star, we don't see it anymore, so we, we look for that dip. And so um, with these two methods, we calculated different metrics to determine which planets are best to observe with each. So for the transmission spectroscopy, we had a relation from um, one of the papers from one of our co-authors, Eliza Kempton. Um, she had been doing a lot of work on the radiative transfer and the way that light goes through the atmosphere of a planet, um, that's kind of her specialty. And so we had a relation from her um, that can allow us to estimate what the size of a spectral signature would be from a planet based off of a few different things like its mass and its temperature um, and so things like that. And so that's how we determined which planets might be good for transmission spectroscopy. For emission spectroscopy, it was a little bit more straightforward. We just saw, well, if all of these planets are whatever their temperatures are, then they must be emitting some amount of thermal radiation. And the ones that have the most thermal radiation are probably the ones that we want to observe or because they're the easiest to observe. And then within there, there's a few other metrics called spectroscopy metrics that are pretty similar. Um, but these were these were the ones that uh, that that we used you're talking about like one method to look at the planet going in front one when it's going behind i guess what are the physical characteristics of the planet the star the orbit the radius the atmosphere that are contributing to these decision criteria so one of the key uh parameters that really drives what the atmosphere is like, because we're really trying to determine what is the atmosphere like on these planets. And one of the key metrics is the mass. And so we want to be able to measure the mass. We can't measure the mass with JWST or TESS. We need some ground-based observations to do that. But we can kind of extrapolate it out from the radius. So there is a, a relationship between the radius and the mass. Bigger radii equal bigger masses. And so, um, we use that relationship for all of these candidates that don't have a measured mass to estimate what the mass would be. And if it has this mass, then it probably has this kind of atmosphere. And then we can back that out to see, okay, then it should have this kind of spectral, spectral feature size. And we can, we can make a lot of inferences about the atmosphere um, without directly observing it um, in support of future observations to directly observe it. Uh, the other kind of key parameter that we want here is equilibrium temperature. And equilibrium temperature is a great indicator for what kind of chemistry is going on in the atmosphere. So hotter planets have um, different species in the atmosphere than uh, cooler planets. And so we see that in, in our solar system too, right? Venus, super hot. Uh, is very different from Mars, which is relatively cooler, or even the gas giants, which are farther out and really cool compared to these terrestrial planets. So um, when we prioritized all of our plant, all of these planets in our work, uh, we split them up in a grid of planetary radius and equilibrium temperature, because these are kind of the two main proxy parameters that will inform our understanding of these exoplanet atmospheres. And we thought that it was very important to not just have a single list for transmission and emission, but to break it up within different kind of cells for each of these parts of parameter space, because all of these planets are so, so different. You have small rocky planets, you have big gaseous planets, you have hot planets, cold planets, everything in between. And um, we just have such a variety of exoplanets out there that um, putting them on this axis and kind of breaking them up into their individual little categories is really important to do if we want to get a good sample of what are the best planets across the whole zoo of exoplanets that we have now. 
Now, like I know you can't get the mass without the radial velocity method, and that, as you said, requires those ground observations. That work is being done as quickly as possible. Is is it that that it is slower to gather the the masses of these planets than tests can find them, and so you don't want to just wait. I mean, it, or would it be more effective to just run a pipeline, put all these candidate planets into one bucket, let the the radio velocity folks derive the masses for you to give because the time on GWC is so precious. Absolutely. Yeah. And that you hit the nail on the head. The, the bottleneck here is the determination of masses for these planets. So we do need to collect radial velocity measurements from ground based observatories. And oftentimes not only can they only look at a few targets per night, but they're um, bound by which stars are up. You can really only look at stars in the nighttime and um, where on Earth they are. They can't see anything that's too high or too low of a latitude. And then you get into all the nitty gritty technical details of, well, you know, this planet isn't massive enough to create a large enough signal, so we can't see it with all of these different observatories. And there's a lot of work being done to make more precise spectrographs and precise instruments, but that's the real bottleneck um, because it's just tough to observe them all piecemeal. There are um, some campaigns and surveys to do large scale radio velocities, but um, it's, it's not on the magnitude of TESS, where TESS is observing the entire sky or some huge fraction of the sky over a couple years. Um, so we are really just finding a lot of test candidates. Um, and I don't know if we're quite outpacing radio velocity measurements because the other bottleneck is um, the time that scientists have to actually look at all of these TOIs. Um, and so that's a whole other discussion of can we automate that? Can we algorithmic, you know, make that uh, automated? Um, but it's it's a huge data volume, which is great, but it does have its pitfalls. And so um, we were just trying to do it as fast as we can um, while JWST is up there. Now, when you took all of the data that exists so far, ran it through these various filters and 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 measurements, did some obvious, you know, future targets pop out of that had maybe been overlooked? Absolutely. And that was probably one of the more surprising things uh, that that I encountered in doing this. So um, while I said that the kind of gold standard of planet discovery is confirming a mass with radial velocity, we can perform uh, some sort of statistical validation so that we can say we're almost certain that this is a planet, but it's not 100 percent certain. So that involves a whole suite of tests comparing to different false positives and stuff. But um, when we first just looked at all of the different test light curves and we looked at all of the planet transits, um, you know, you look at enough transits long enough, you can be like, oh, yeah, that one looks like a planet. That's a planet. Or no, 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 that is that is a star. That's not a planet. And so <clears throat> it was actually really amazing seeing some of the earliest TOIs that were discovered uh, some of them were planets. They weren't just junk. Um, and so the question then became like, well, why hasn't anyone looked at this? Like these are some of the first ones, like TOI 179 or something like that. That's like the 179th TOI that was announced or, you know, these very early TOIs that ended up being planets. Um, and I think it does speak to that lack of time and resources sometimes that that teams have to go through um, and also shifting focus in the field. So a lot of the earlier TOIs that um, ended up being planets were actually hot Jupiters. And I love hot Jupiters. I think they are fantastic and very interesting. Um, there is a subset of people who are like, oh, it's just another hot Jupiter. Like, let's go look for Earth 2.0, which I think is also important to do. But different teams, different priorities. Um, so I was really astounded that there were so many of these really just like low hanging fruit type candidates that were in this sample. Um, and I'm really excited because that means that there are still so many more to find. There are so many more out there that we just don't know of yet. And the fact that they made it onto our JWST best in class list means that they're also just really good targets to look at with JWST and to further 
dig into and determine what's going on there. So to clarify for people, TOI, that's a test object of interest, which is yes. the, the candidate exoplanets that the test mission is, is finding. And then people are, are confirming, and then they move over to exoplanet proper exoplanet when all of the confirmation has, has been made. It sounds to me like there's a potentially a bit of a tension here where on the one hand, you have individual astronomer teams who are trying to research very specific exoplanets, and they're going to make the case to the space telescope science institute that that these are targets and they should be able to get time on the telescope then on the other hand you are sort of doing a lot of the legwork in advance with almost the entire community saying let's pool our resources let's let's come to the space telescope team with a list in order and then we can know that we're trying to use that telescope time the most efficiently uh, which way do you see this sort of going that's a great question. And I think that it has to be some sort of middle ground. So as I said in the beginning, these best in class targets are termed best in class, not because we think that they're going to find life or they're going to solve some formation puzzle, but because they're just going to be some of the easiest to observe. And so I think that um, as a field, we should take that into consideration when looking for different targets to fill our specific science goals. So I do think that the field does need to continue to be science driven, um, but can use this as a resource. So for instance, if I'm trying to assemble a JWST program that looks at sub Neptunes that are between 800 Kelvin and 1200 Kelvin, right? Um, I can, I can pull from this list and use that to fill in my particular science goal. So it's still driven by the individuals wanting to pursue their individual science questions, which I think is incredibly important. Um, but this kind of removes, it abstracts some of, some of the legwork, like you said, um, from the individual teams that are trying to do this. Um, but I think, uh, one, I think that it's also really important to highlight that while these individual science questions are useful, um, we're now at the point in exoplanet science where we can zoom out. We can look at planets as an ensemble. We can look at not only populations, but all populations. <clears throat> and I think this is evidenced by the fact that there are so many good targets across the entire parameter space in our best in class sample. Um, you, can, you can compare rocky planets and gaseous planets and everything in between and really dig into all of the different types of planets that we don't have in our solar system. You know, we don't have any sub Neptunes. We don't have any hot Jupiters. Um, and we can fill in those gaps by looking at planets as an ensemble to maybe unify some of our disparate knowledge and disparate theories um, and draw some new conclusions about planets as a whole. Um, and it's, it's really amazing that TESS has enabled that with just its sheer volume of planet discoveries. It's kind of amazing to me, you know, when I'm doing my reporting and I'm looking through the journals or looking through papers and I see that a planet has been discovered or, you know, people are characterizing a planet and I'll, you know, I'll quickly look through it and go like, how is this special? And if right. it's, if it's not special, I'm like, nah, it's not really news, which is bonkers, right? <laughs> that, that I am here, you know, just a couple of decades into this era of us finding planets and me thinking, well, they found a planet around another star, but it's not interesting enough for us to report on. And I'm going to need something better. I need something with a little more pizzazz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, it is, it is kind of, and I can see that it's probably a similar situation where, where now you have to make the case that this is just a planet, like there is something more to this planet that is fitting within some specific area of research that you're trying to uncover, and that we are living in this world of large scale, hundreds of planets, thousands of planets, you can start to make some some larger um, expectations about them. I, I guess that's mm -hmm. my question is, like, now that we are 28 years into exoplanets, um, have we got any kind of large scale things that we can say about planets around other stars? Yeah, I think there's, there's plenty to say about individual populations and planets in general. I think the first that comes to mind is that there are so many of them, right? You know, 
28 years ago, we had our little nice solar system and we thought that that's, that's how planets work. That's how planets form. You have this neat little set of rocky planets on the inside and this neat little set of gaseous planets on the outside. And then we discovered it, planets around other stars and that completely blew it all open. Just absolute, you know, mayhem. Because now we're seeing, <clears throat> oh, we've got giant planets on the inside and rocky planets on the outside. Or, oh, there are systems that don't have giant planets at all. Or lots of different rocky planets. Or even planet sizes that are different from what we have. We don't have a super Earth. We don't have a sub-Neptune in our solar system. Um, and they're super interesting. I think there was a recent result, uh, K218b, that looked at uh, uh, a sub-Neptune with JWST and it found evidence for a possible water ocean and carbon dioxide and methane and like super interesting things that we just couldn't even fathom before we started looking. And so um, I think some of these population level conclusions um, are good on one hand as like a perspective shift, right? It, it humbles us a little bit to think that we're not the template. We are one of many different possibilities. Um, but I think it's also, it, it comes back and informs our understanding of the solar system too, of like, okay, well, you know, we now need to make how we think the solar system formed reconcile with how we now know that other systems form. Um, one good example is the peas in a pod structure. And so that that's a high formation hypothesis where you have a lot of little terrestrial planets that are very close to one another, close to their star, and they're all about the same size. And then a lot of times that's it. Then they end and there's nothing beyond that. And so we need to somehow reconcile that with our solar system or hot Jupiters too. How did hot Jupiters form and why didn't our Jupiter become a hot Jupiter? We need to reconcile that. So it comes back to inform our understanding of the solar system as well. And so on some level, it is an academic exercise to look at these other planets and say, how do they get here? What can we tell about them? What's there? What are their atmospheres like? <clears throat> but it then comes, it really comes back to home when we then apply that back to our, to ourselves. Um, and I just think that's really fascinating because it, you know, I think a lot of people get into exoplanets because they're interested in seeing what is our place in the universe, right? Is there life? Um, are we special? All that kind of stuff. Um, and so to apply that back to the solar system, I think really tries to get at that question as best as we can. Um, and we've been able to do that with this volume now. When you look at the sky with your eyes and you see all these stars, you're not seeing normal stars. You're seeing incredibly hot, bright stars that in many cases are extremely far away. And you don't have an accurate picture of what the population of stars in our vicinity actually looks like because you just can't see them. And when we look at planets, we see, you know, it took a while for them to realize, oh, no, we're surrounded by red dwarfs and mm -hmm. and all of the stars that are around us, we can't see because they're actually quite dim. And when it comes to planets, we see hot Jupiters because that's the low hanging fruit. What what will it take for us to build an accurate picture of what planetary systems really look like from interior to their version of the, you know, Neptunian realm. <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, honestly, Kepler was a really great start. You kind of just need to stare and you need to have um, incredible sensitivity to just the most minute little, little blips. Um, and I'm really excited for the Roman Space Telescope. It's going to have fantastic sensitivity. It's going to do a long stare. It's not going to do a long stare all around the sky. It's going to just look at one particular part. But I think that's an excellent start because, you know, like Kepler, that'll be able to get um, smaller planets with its increased sensitivity. It'll be able to get longer period planets because it's staring for a long time um, and everything in between, right? And so I think on one hand, you really do need to get that long, intense stare. Um, but on the other hand, I, I do think that it's worthwhile blending methods. So all of the planet discovery methods 
are complementary. I think, you know, this whole time I've been talking about the transit method, right? That's what we've been sweeping under the rug here. And the transit method is fantastic. Don't get me wrong. We've discovered more planets with the transit method than any other method. But it it is very biased towards a specific type of planet, like you alluded to, the hot Jupiters, the big planets on really short orbits. And so in order to capture anything farther out or smaller, we kind of need to leap to other uh, methods as well. And they're all complementary. There's no one single method that will look at the stars and be like, ah, yes, we've done it. There are all the planets. Um, so we need to roll in radio velocity and microlensing and um, astrometry and direct imaging and just attack it from every single direction. Um, and I, I, I'm really excited for a lot of observatories that are up and coming or up and coming. <laughs> They're upcoming. Um, so we've got Roman. Um, Gaia is doing some good stuff with astrometry. JWST is doing some cool direct imaging. We've got some European missions. We've got um, habitable worlds. So it's it's a really great time to be interested in exoplanets um, because I do think that in the near future, we are going to fill out that full parameter space of planets. And a lot of people talk about the race to the bottom, which is just um, what are the smallest planets that we can observe right now? You want to race to the bottom of the radius parameter space. And I think that's great. We need to find small planets. We're lacking on known small planets around other stars. Um, but we also need to just make sure we cover all parameter space to get that full picture. And I think that we're going to get much closer to that in the next few years or decades. I think, for, you know, a lot of my audience are definitely big fans of exoplanetary research. And they're all excited about, you know, when are we going to find that next Earth? But I like how quickly do you fall off this cliff of accessibility of this additional data? You know, back to that Kepler idea. Yeah, Kepler mm -hmm. would have been amazing because it would have stared at the same spot in the sky year after year after year. And it would have, you know, caught all the hot Jupiters. And then it would have caught the stuff that was orbiting once per year because it would catch it and then it would catch it a year later. And then maybe a third time. And then maybe it would start to catch the stuff that was showing up once per year. Three years, maybe if it was if it had lasted long enough, if its poor little, uh, you know, equipment had had survived. Mm -hmm. But, but like to see a Jupiter, you're looking at years for each orbit. A Saturn would take what eleven and a half years per orbit, right? Uh, so you'd have to stare for thirty years to really confirm your your planet there. And as you said, the transit method is really gonna gonna fall off. But can the direct imaging method fill in the cracks for that kind of thing? Or is it just they're too faint as a reflected light? Yeah, I think um, at this point in time, they're probably too faint. Um, I don't deal too much with direct imaging. So if someone in the comments is going to be like, that's not right, you know. I'm looking on it right now. I'm, I'm looking at it in my telescope. Right. Yeah, I have yeah. it pulled up in front of me. Um, I, but my understanding is that we're not quite there yet. But um, that in the near future, especially with coronagraph technology, um, we're going to be able to get there. And so one of the cool parts about the Roman Space Telescope is that they are going to have a technology demonstration with a coronagraph. And a coronagraph, for those of us who may not know, is something that just goes in front of the host star. And it's like you're putting your thumb in front of a light bulb and you're just blocking that light so you can see what's around it. Um, and that helps us see that, that's essentially how direct imaging works. And so it's going to fly. I think it's going to fly information, but it's going to block out the starlight and hopefully use Roman's crazy sensitivity to look and find these types of planets. But I, I do think you raise an excellent point that it is not necessarily um, accessible as a, a means for wide scale searches. It's really like a one off. You need specialized equipment to do it. Um, and my hope is that in the future, this this technique becomes more routine and maybe becomes cheaper, too. I know that is a factor. Um, and as we develop our telescope technology, it it's less of a, hey, we're, we're now looking at dozens of targets. And it's, hey, we're now looking at hundreds or even thousands of targets. Um, but I do think that at least on the front of 
long period planets, there is a little bit of a backdoor. So for those Saturn or Jupiter or even Neptune sized planets um, that are on these long orbits, we may be able to discover them with tests. So we see a single transit, um, but then we're not going to see another transit for many, many years, decades even. Um, but the best part about these planets is that they're big. And so um, although we don't know the exact orbital period from the transit shape, we can kind of tease out what potential periods there would be. So we can get a family of periods based on just how the the duration of the transit um, because if it's on a longer period transit it's going to spend more time in front of the host star um, and if it's on a shorter one it's going to zip around quicker so if you have a longer transit you can kind of guess at what the period would be even if you've just seen it once um, and this is where we can use our follow-up resources to just say okay well it's either going to be in two years four years eight years etc and we'll just be looking we're just going to make sure to check back all the time um, because photometry is relatively cheap. You know, you can just shotgun blast, look at the sky. And if you have high enough cadence, then you can see something. And so that's a little bit of a backdoor mm -hmm. um, to, to answer that. That's really interesting um, that you can get a sense just watching the transit time of, of what orbit the planet might be. And so mm -hmm. there's got to be some objects in the list that you look at and go, I really wish we could confirm this one because it is it is really exciting. Are, are there some of them in there? Like, like what are the most exciting unconfirmed exoplanets, <laughs> examples of things that you've seen? Um, so we do have a host of single transitors in our best in class sample. Um, they're not we don't expect them to be on super long orbits. I think the the highest bound for the period of any of them that are that made it on the list is on the order of a thousand days, which it's a long time. Don't get me wrong, but you know it's not on the order of decades. Um, so the, the, there there are teams actively working on trying to hone in on those. So those are exciting. Um, not on the list though. My my heart, like I said, is with hot Jupiters, um, and so one type of planet that I am very excited to discover and keep discovering um, our additional planets in hot Jupiter systems. So um, a couple or one one system did make it onto the best in class list. It is already confirmed TOI 1130. Um, so there were no unconfirmed near planets nearby hot Jupiters that made it onto our best in class list, uh, but they do exist. There are TOIs out there that are these kind of small planets nearby hot Jupiters. And it's fascinating because um, we know of more than 500 hot Jupiters and almost all of them are the only planet in their system out to hundreds of days. Um, and this has something to do with how they form. And so anytime you find uh, a planet nearby a hot Jupiter, it's like, oh, whoa, okay. Like this is one of six. Um, so it's super exciting. But uh, we do have one system like that on the best in class sample. It is already confirmed, which is good. We've got masses and it's, we're going to, I think it's been approved for JWST cycle two observations. So we're going to see what happens there. I think there's going to be a real treasure trove of data to inform our, our, our understanding of hot Jupiter formation. It was, it was a big enough surprise that it was awarded the Nobel, Nobel prize in 2018, I believe, but <laughs> Um, I think it's a huge question mark that we think we have an answer to, but we're really not sure. Um, so I'm excited to see what JWST does with that um, and what TESS continues to find uh, with, with the, these new hot Jupiters and any potential companion planets nearby. I mean, I guess that's the question, right? Is that how did these planets get so close to their star? And if you can see the interactions with the other planets in the system, maybe that will allow you to, to puzzle out what this mechanism was. And and back to your earlier point, I think there was one fairly recently where astronomers saw the transit, then they did follow on observations with the very large telescope, I think, and mm -hmm. they were able to see the planet. So they were able to predict that the planet was there. And then they were able to make a visual confirmation because it happened to have a really wide orbit, but or they, they found what the radio velocity meant, there's some way that they knew that the planet was going to be there. And then they were able to, you know, if you direct one of these monster telescopes, then you can find them. But mm -hmm. just they're so oversubscribed that they, you don't have time to go and do a follow up. Absolutely. So, 
you know, if like right now, there is a range of instruments coming online. Obviously, we've got JWST right now. We've got the aerial mission, which is going to help characterize exoplanet atmospheres. There's, you know, Vera Rubin is going to be doing this from the ground. You've got Gaia for astrometry. You've got, um, uh, you know, so many other spacecraft, Nancy Grace Roman. But if you were to sort of like think through beyond those tools, like mm -hmm. after that, and, you know, the Habitable Worlds Observatory for making specific observations of, of an exoplanet, you know, look at two dozen other Earths. But to really fill in all of those cracks, what do you think would be like, in, you know, there's no limit, um, you know, I'll write <laughs> as big a check as you need. Um, what is the sort of tool that would get us the most results sort of with our current understanding, do you think? That's a good question. And I think you just described every astronomer's like dream come true. <laughs> um, I know. Yeah. Yes. But fortunately, you know, and I know you're like, I can't guarantee I'll, I'll fund it. But, you know. <laughs> well, I'll pull our money. It'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, we'll crowdfund it. That is a tough question though. And I think it's tough to answer because all of the exoplanet discovery methods are so complementary. Um, you know, you really can't advance too far in one without advancing in the others in order to fill out the parameter space. Um, I, I do think that direct imaging is going is going to have a really big renaissance very soon. And I think that that is a real up and coming method um, because I do think that while there are plenty more nearby planets to or planets nearby their host stars, short orbit planets uh, to discover, I do think that the biggest question mark currently in our parameter space is those long period planets. Uh, I think depending on who you ask, they would disagree with me and say that we need to find smaller planets and have bigger telescopes, which is valid. I, I agree. But I think that the kind of most glaring absence in our uh, understanding of exoplanets is these long period planets. Um, and we can kind of get at it with radial velocity. Um, we can see like parts of a trend, but it's tough to say, well, is that just the host star moving around or is there another star moving it around? So I think that actually imaging them with direct imaging is going to be just such a boon for the understanding of exoplanets. Um, and I think part of that is because um, we, we've, we I've talked a lot about how we now have all these new formation theories and dynamics theories and stuff like that, but they're pretty much all based on our subset of planets that are near to their host stars. And beyond that, it's a big hand wave of like, probably this is how it works. You know, there's a lot of theory, there's a few hand-picked examples, but to build up that kind of statistical set would be really, really interesting because I think that not only would that inform our solar system again, but like it, it, I think it would change our formation theories about the planets that we do currently know. So like I've said, we have that peas in a pod formation theory and they, have a bunch of little planets and then they stop and then it's nothing. But is it nothing? Do we know that it's nothing? If, if it's not, then how does that change how we think that these planets form? And I, I do think that that's where direct imaging will really shine. Uh, no pun intended. But. Okay. So I've got my, I've got the idea then. All right. So it's, so it's like Kepler. Mm -hmm. And so it will stare at some region of sky for a very long time, but it has a chronograph to block every single star in the field of view. <laughs> and then we'll do direct imaging to search for anything around any of these spots that it's, that it's obscuring. And then over time it will, you know, provide candidates. That there sounds great to me. All yeah, right. I, sounds good. I'm sure it's I, easy. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure someone's figured it out. Figured out a way to, <laughs> to make a chronograph that can block uh, you know, 10,000 stars in a field of view, uh, right. be a piece of cake. Just, just do uh, one of the things they did with like, uh, DSS, you know, just drill holes in a, <laughs> yes. in a plate or something like that. Yeah. Opposite. 
Yeah, that's amazing. I don't know if you've seen the like the newer version of that where they can do this dynamically now. So they've got all this fiber optics mm-hmm. and they can kind of change the the plates on the digital sky survey in real time. But in the old version, yeah, they had drilled a little hole, they put a fiber optic cable and they had that fiber optic just looking at that, you know, every fiber optic corresponded to one galaxy in the field of view. And they had to swap that's out the amazing. plates when they were looking at a different part of the sky. Bonkers work. It's crazy. I'm, yeah. I'm always blown away by just the ingenuity that these these technicians and that these engineers come up with for telescopes and instruments. And, you know, sometimes it goes over my head a little bit because I'm not an instrument person. I kind of just want the bottom line of like, what can it do? How do I do it? But people talk about these this new generation of spectrographs for radial velocities. I'm like, oh, my God, like. This is crazy. I had no idea that there were so many factors that go into this. And you're talking about laser combs and, you know, extracting the the stellar noise. Like, wow, like this is really, really cool. Yeah. The next level is you talk to the people working on gravitational wave observatories as they're <laughs> as they're like quantum squeezing. Um, yeah. It's a it's amazing the the level of like what they're able to pull out of these these incredible telescopes. Absolutely. So, you know, this paper is, you know, was published fairly recently. Um, but what are you obsessed about right now? So I have kind of two obsessions right now. The first is the hot Jupiter formation question. Um, I'm working on a system right now that is a hot Jupiter with a nearby companion planet. Um, this is in its early stages, so I won't give too much away, but um, we're beginning to see a sort of trend in these hot Jupiters with nearby companion planets. So like I said, most hot Jupiters don't have any, and the fact that these do is interesting because we think that hot Jupiters primarily form via high eccentricity migration, where they actually form far out from their host star, Um, But then some sort of gravitational interaction kind of kicks them inwards and they scatter out all of the other planets inside their original orbit. And then eventually they circularize and arrive at their current orbit. And so if that is the dominant mechanism, then we don't expect to see any other planets because they've all been scattered out. Um, And so we don't see very many hot Jupiters with nearby planets. So it would be nice to just wash our hands of that and say, well, yeah, they all most of them form through high eccentricity migration. Um, but we do have this kind of thorn in in the side of that theory that um, there are planets, there are hot Jupiters with nearby companion planets. So they can't have formed through high eccentricity migration. They have to either have formed where they are, which is improbable, and or they formed through a more quiescent form of migration. And so we're beginning to look at all these different um, systems now as kind of an ensemble because we have six, seven, rather than just one or two pre-tests. Um, and so we can kind of tease out different uh, population level phenomena. And so one of them is that um, we are not really seeing many of the companion planets that are exterior to the hot Jupiter. We're primarily seeing companion planets that are interior, so between the star and mm. the hot Jupiter on, on shorter orbits. So it ate um, them. What's that? It ate them. It ate its- it. Ate them. Well, it could have. So actually, it's interesting because it could be the opposite. So if there are exterior planets to the hot Jupiter, the um, exterior planets could actually leach the the angular momentum from the orbit of the hot Jupiter, and their orbits get wider, and the hot Jupiter orbit gets smaller, and eventually it's engulfed by the star. So in a sense, these kind of smaller planets are crowding out this hot Jupiter and pushing it into the host star, which I think is crazy because when we think of a Jupiter sized planet, you know, it's the big dog in the yard, like no one can touch Jupiter. But yet, if you have enough of these little planets, it pushes the Jupiter into the star. So it's very interesting dynamically. And I think that, you know, uncovering these different um, architectures and drawing these population level conclusions for this subset of hot Jupiters with companion planets is going to be really interesting. And, you know, seven or eight is not a huge sample size, but when almost all of them are looking one particular way, it becomes very exciting. I mean, 
whenever I talk about hot Jupiters and how they formed, I have to give the two possibilities. So if you could resolve that, that would be a real time saver. Uh, you <laughs> mentioned two things you were obsessing about. So what, what was the other thing that you were obsessing about? So the other thing that I'm obsessing about now is um, I'm currently working on the Pandora SmallSat mission. So the Pandora SmallSat mission is uh, an exoplanet mission. It's set to launch no earlier than March 2025. And what it's going to do is it's going to hang out in low Earth orbit and observe the exoplanet, the atmospheres of dozens of exoplanets. It could be anywhere from 20 to 30 to 40, um, depending on the time. And what it's going to do is it's going to look at not only the atmospheres of the exoplanets, but also the host stars in both the optical and the infrared wavelengths. So in doing so, it's going to collect data about the atmospheres of the exoplanets through transmission spectroscopy. But by also looking at the host star, it's going to kind of quantify what the impact of the host star's stellar activity and variability is on the atmosphere of the, of the exoplanet so we can get even more precise measurements of what the uh, exoplanet's atmosphere is. And this has been a, a real problem of late because I think what a lot of people forget is that when we look at uh, a star that has an exoplanet and we're looking at the atmosphere, it's not quite direct imaging. We, we can't really disentangle the two. We're just looking at a single point of light. And so it's up to us to subtract off what the star's spectrum is from the total, because if you subtract the star, then you're just left with the exoplanet. And that's great in theory, but it's a little bit tougher to do in practice because sometimes we don't know exactly what the spectrum of the star is, or it changes over time, it's, it's variable. And so by looking at the star and the exoplanet for um, long durations and lots of different visits with this new uh, telescope in multiple different wavelength channels, we can quantify what that variability over time is of the, the star's spectrum, and then use that to subtract that off from the total to get a more precise view of what the exoplanet's atmosphere looks like. Um, and so one, we're using actually a lot of leftover parts from JWST. <laughs> so the thanks, thanks NASA for that one. <laughs> but, um, that is root through your junk drawer. Right. Yeah. Reduce, reuse, recycle, I guess. But um, we're also hoping that because we have, it's not a one-to-one -one match with JWST, but it's pretty close. We're hoping that we can use whatever stellar activity we quantify with Pandora to then reanalyze JWST data, because then we'll get like the most, most precise uh, spectrum from an exoplanet atmosphere. Um, and it's, th this has kind of been a problem of, of late. There have been some discoveries that, uh, you know, say, oh, we found, you know, potential water vapor in the atmosphere, but we can't rule out that it's actually just noise from the host star. And so in those cases, we would really like to know if there's actually water vapor there um, because that's a, that's a great biosignature. Uh, so this is, this is upcoming. We're still in the... Um, construction stages of this observatory. Um, and so fingers crossed that it launches soon. It's a ride share, so we don't get to choose the exact launch date. We're a little bit at the mercy of NASA and whoever else is launching. So no earlier than March 2025, but we're hoping that it is around March 2025 so that we can take advantage of JWST while it's collecting all this great data and maybe even do some simultaneous observations. Yeah, I mean, just in the last year or two, I mean, we're starting to get all of this atmospheric data. And so this is the new open frontier. And we're, you know, we were gonna have to wait until Ariel, what 2028, to get like a proper right. flagship mission that's searching for atmospheres. But mm -hmm. this will be amazing. And probably like a lot of the techniques and stuff that you're learning, the Ariel team will be able to take advantage of when they launch. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's been some discussion within the Pandora team um, because we're assembling our target list at this point in time. Um, should we, and Ariel has, has a published notional target list as well. And so should we prioritize that, that some of the targets that they're looking at? So we should also look at them so that we can inform 
what they will eventually see to, to again, make that really, really precise measurement with Ariel after they know the, the stellar activity. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of synergy between all of these different exoplanet atmospheric observatories. And I think, like, as you alluded to, it, it just blows my mind that up until now with either Pandora or Ariel or habitable worlds, um, none of the telescopes that we've been using for exoplanet atmospheric characterization were explicitly built to do so. You know, JWST took so long, it was meant to look at distant galaxies, but turns out the instruments that look at distant galaxies are also really good at looking at exoplanet atmospheres. And so I'm really excited to see what dedicated exoplanet missions can do because we've just seen such amazing results from these kind of generic workhorses like Hubble and JWST and all these ground-based observatories as well. Oh, wonderful. I look forward to that that mission as well. Well, Ben, it was a pleasure to talk to you today. If people want to keep track of the work that you're doing and and the missions and such, what's the best place to do that? So um, I'm working at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, so you can keep track of Pandora and JWST through all those NASA portals. Um, you can find me online at on Twitter at Ben Horde, or you can find my NASA page. Um, if you just Google Ben Horde, I come up. Um, and I'm you know, looking forward to doing some other cool stuff. So hopefully everyone comes along this journey with me. That sounds great. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you again. And good luck with the, the uh, I guess, when these observations actually start making to the queue at JWST and you start to learn some of these answers. And especially if you figure out one way or the other about, about how hot Jupiter is formed, please let me know so that I can save some time. <laughs> I will. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofiolara, Dustin Cable, Just Paul Davis, Vlad Shiplin, Jay Dennis, David Giltonad, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Veriboff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.